So a few days later from our last evaluations video, we have got a new batch of six scores. It's sort of almost like five and a half scores because there's somebody who's coming in um, to offer another score uh, on top of their previous, uh, their previous evaluation. So um, normally I would, you know, I, I wouldn't, um, you know, evaluate score after score by the same uh, orchestrator or composer, uh, you know, on, on a challenge like this. But I will give it a quick look, and um, there's some feedback that occurs to me from looking at it. So, you know, since it is an entirely new um, attempt, um, then it's, it's worth a look. So uh, this score is by Richard, who just recently joined... And I think it's great that a lot of um, uh, very new members have um, jumped into this challenge and offered some uh, some of their scores, some of their attempts, and and you know if people have joined just to do this, then that's great. You know, it's 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 really great to have you guys here, and and um, you know, welcome to the group. So uh, I was really impressed by this score. Um, I could, you know, there are. A few things, a few balance things, and a few, um, um, a few textural things. Uh, but it's you know I feel in a score like this, um, it's it's more. You know, I can offer observations more than critiques because the orchestration is quite polished. Um, I like the fact that that there is there has been some attention to um, to detail here. Um, there have been excellent, you know. There's excellent uh, phrasing in in the uh, in the melodies for the winds and the uh, and really good uh, bowing for the violins. Okay, so um, the problem I would have here, I mean, it's great that there are these hairpins in here. I think after a while it gets to be a little repetitive. Just you know, um, just like swelling on you know every two bars. The thing that worries me is that this takes off here, the um, the clarinet solo takes off to a mezzo forte, but the strings kind of don't do anything. Do you know what I mean? They're just kind of just sitting there, so they don't they don't swell with the violin to you know to have a fuller sound here. As a result, this uh, note sit, sort of sticks out like a sore thumb a bit. Right, instead of sort of being a slightly sinister sound in the background, right? Um, yeah, so I would I would think more more in overall terms here, you know, to follow the the dynamic phrasing, and you know, here you could have had a little bit more inflection, I think, in both parts, but that's all right. Um, yeah, so so I mean, a nice strategy: bassoons dovetailing to clarinets and then oboes with a little bit of help from above. Now, <clears throat> this kind of octave scoring in the texture that you've got means, especially here, where the clarinets come in at the octave, this means that this may get swallowed up. You probably notice that the flutes did not really stand out very much, um, and that is really just a phenomenon of acoustics. Why, you know, putting the putting the flutes way up high in a passage like this may actually just be uh, added resonance underlining the um, the overtones of the oboe or the oboe and the clarinet in octaves rather than adding its own you know fundamental sound up there All right okay <clears throat> but you know very clever support here I felt that that was extremely strong and um, and some of these little added lines, they are kind of more uh, Strauss than they are Ravel. Do you know what I mean? Well, I mean, Ravel was very influenced by Johann Strauss, not Richard Strauss. Um, he was very influenced by Johann Strauss in, like, his um, uh, La Valse, which was sort of like almost a, um, it was like a, a, an homage to to Johann Strauss in a way, and you know the Waltz Kings um, like Waldteufel and uh, 
and you know just a bunch of other composers nobody would recognize today. Now I think it's interesting that you how get these these very cool um, you know wind you know essentially it's a woodwind uh, introduction in terms of the melody, and then at B it becomes really all about the strings and the strings basically carry the melody all the way through till the uh, to the appassionata section. Now, <clears throat> just a couple of observations here. Perhaps some of these um, some of these dynamic markings are left over from when you were using a different sound set. But um, you know, I want to know why the oboes are pianissimo and the um, the muted horn is piano, right? Did you notice how they're just sort of, once again, like a sore thumb, kind of just stuck out from the texture? This needs to be pianissimo. This could probably be piano, right? It doesn't need to be uh, taken down, right? Could be Because essentially it's working together harmonically with the clarinet, so they should really be the same dynamic. <clears throat> One thing that orchestrators need to understand is that everybody is listening to everybody else's part. People who are not used to toning it down will not understand um, that their part is marked at one dynamic and uh, an instrument that is sitting right next to them is marked at another dynamic, right? Unless they sort of say, hey, what do you have there? Oh, I've got a pianissimo. Oh, right, and I've got a P, so I'm, I'm supposed to stand out more than you. But they generally don't have those conversations, so they will, um, you know, so the the clarinet will just be happily sitting around playing this at piano, what they think piano is, to match what's going on with everybody else. And the oboes will be listening. They'll say, wow, that's kind of a slightly louder pianissimo than what I thought. Okay, well, I'll just, you know, everybody's going to be a little louder here. I'll play a little louder. It's generally better to have more homogeneous... Um, uh, dynamic markings as a result, except for the brass are kind of used to toning it down. If they see a pianissimo, they kind of like, will get it, you know what I mean? Where Whereas the winds, you know, inside their own section, having a bunch of different marked dynamics may not. Do you know what I mean? So, anyway, moving on. So, yeah, so you've got some support. You've got, like, um, some doubling by the oboes, right, which is very cool, and then octave oboes, not quite as successful as you might imagine. This is going to be exposed below the uh, first violin, and, um, and it will be heading into very honky territory. Um, you know, if you've got a bass clarinet here, that's better, like the, the bass clarinet will take this lower line way better than the, um, you know, be able to play it at mezzo forte, a very controlled mezzo forte, way better than a um, than the second oboe player, right? You're going all the way down to C, you know, one more note is B, which is the traditional bottom note of the oboe until they developed the B flat uh, key, and then that note is even harder to get under control. So yeah, so don't you know, just just really watch out, and also octave oboes. Are you familiar with, um, you know, that, you know, octave, octave uh, winds in general um, have a sort of an organ-like sound, um, you know, whether it's flutes, clarinets, especially clarinets, and oboes also have sort of like that kind of added pungency when you put them in octaves together like this, and one of the partners is exposed, right? There's no, there's no doubling for, on the second violin for this, or the violas, <clears throat> And they're not they're not doing anything. See if you had support or doubling from the from the middle strings. <clears throat> for uh for this lower line, then those those kind of slightly blaring um qualities would not be so evident, but they still wouldn't be the best mix. Okay, now here you've got a triple octave, but you still have just kind of like almost nothing going on in terms of yeah, so so this comes off because of these oboe, sorry, oboes, because of these clarinets um, being focused and concentrated together with the violins. Once again, a lone flute above that texture is going to be more 
um, just kind of supporting the resonance of what's below rather than standing out on its own unless you marked it up dynamically. A little bit of fiddling around with mezzo piano and mezzo forte. I'm not going to get into it uh, right now. This is nice. I like this. Bassoons um, and uh, oboes together. And, you know, this works pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, so so nice. I like the I like the harmonic support in here. I like these little piccolo notes. That's kind of cool. Now, <clears throat> I kind of felt just a certain in terms of like a taste thing. Well, I don't want to say that you have bad taste. It's like you do have good taste with this. Very tasteful. But I'm just wondering if you even need these notes on the um, on the timpani when you have the bass drum coming in. <clears throat> Sorry, it's very early in the morning over here in New Zealand. Um, yeah, so it just yeah, it just seems a bit much since you're already doing this kind of tuck ta tuck ta tuck ta brr, boom boom boom. I mean, it just you know really kind of feels a little much um, when you've already have the bass drum, which is going to be much more profound, right? Um, yeah, I'm just checking out your timpani part really quick here. Okay, all right, it's all good. Yeah, so so nice distribution of melodic and counter melodic elements. Uh, that was good. Some people, you know, would would focus all on one or all on the other. And you know, I felt that this is really done, and I felt that the impulse all the way through, the rhythmic impulse was was very very well done. And this is totally cool. You know, the first on the melody and the second on the counter melody. Um, but, you know, that's really a dense, dense sound. You know, uh, you've got <clears throat> basically triple a triple wind on this uh, and kind of, you know, almost nothing above, right? Because um, the, the counter melody does intersect, right, in between these two lines, in between this octave line, as opposed to everything being down. Now, of course, you can get... You get a bit of the overtones filling in, but it's not still not quite the same. Anyways, but nice handling, and I like the fact that your um, your um, you you held it back on the brass to just like uh, four players. Okay, yeah, and the cool down was very nice. Yeah, cellos, cellos, flute, and second violin. Yep, and oboe. Yeah, so that all feels good. I like this. I like this line in here with the uh, B flat clarinet. Yeah, good scoring. Good scoring. And then uh, bassoon solo coming back just like it was before. And you've given people time to put on their mutes. <clears throat> That's very cool. Yeah, all very nicely done. And good contrast of register between the two um, the two finishing ideas. Although, in the original score, it was piano, then mezzo forte, right? So, so that there could be a contrast and then a falling off as the music led to the end, right? But I mean, yeah, you know, it's just natural to play a little louder when you're a little bit lower sometimes. You know, kind of digging in. Yeah, and this was all well done. Um, yeah. Now, you know, a few last comments. Nice that you scored it in D major. That's actually a much easier key for the, um, you know, for the strings to feel resonant in. And very cool that you did, like, solo players uh, playing to the end. And that, you know, that you didn't have to take the, um, you know, the very, very high uh, register for these, um, for these reaching notes. And then you just had the uh, piccolo on top giving the illusion of of extreme height yeah and this is all very cool coming on in the end so i would say just you know don't parse your dynamics too much you know like scoring like trying to use the dynamics as a mixing board you know a little bit here a little bit there a little less there you know try to have more general dynamics um across the orchestra with you know maybe some featured parts being louder or maybe some really you know like in here this is great uh, some, you know, some possibly overwhelming parts being marked lower. 
So yeah, so just, you know, you'll get a sense for this and you have really good instincts. So was really happy um, to make this score the first of the batch and um, there's just more great stuff coming. So stay tuned and here comes the next score. Thanks very much, Richard. Our next piece is Travis's um, entry here. And um, it's it's got a lot of very cool qualities to it. Um, I, I don't want to be too harsh and and I actually I actually feel that there is like there are some some really unique elements that are kind of almost like chamber music in here. Um, there are some there's some things that got left out and there's a few there are a few um, sort of reinter reinterpretations of the harmony in places or or possibly errors. So uh, I don't want to get into that. I'm not a harmony teacher. I mean, of course I could describe what they are, but that's that doesn't excite me. You know, it's sort of like asking, you know, it's kind of like asking a chef, you know, like a gourmet chef to make you a hamburger. That's just like really not where I, you know, well, I don't want to compare myself to a gourmet chef. I don't, I don't know if I'm that great. But, um, but yeah, but it's just, you know, that's not my specialty, right? Um, so, so anyways, um, you know, it's not, it's not what I, it's not what I love to, love to teach, right? Just, you know, making, you know, saying, oh, you, that should, that, that C, uh, C natural, sorry, that C flat should have been a C natural or, oh, you know, you left this out or whatever. Okay. So moving on, really, really nice. Um, you know, choice of English horn as the um, as the opening voice, and I actually made that choice too in my um, in my version, as you guys will see soon. Okay, very cool to have the clarinets taking up the harmony below, and um, one thing that I would caution here, and that is that the opening seems to be a little draggy in in terms of like the impulse, and that is you know, possibly because the uh, bassoons are are playing such long, um, you know, playing such such long time values, right? They're not um, they're they're not playing staccato along with the pizzicato of the um, of the strings. Now here, um, I, I note that the you know you can you can mark these long time values in pizzicato for cello and viola. Um, you know, the thing is that, like, it's, even with cello, it's really not going to, the sound is not going to last that long. Pizzicato works upon the same principles as, like, bass drum, you know. Bass drum hit is usually marked as just, like, a, an, a quarter note. And the room does the rest, you know, the, 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 it, the, it's a per very concussive sound, and the concussive sound excites the, um, excites the sound waves throughout the hall. So essentially that's what that's why you almost never need to mark pizzicato as more than a quarter note, really. Um, so so I mean you could say uh, P sostenuto if you really want the player to like kind of continue to uh, do a bit of tremolo in there to try, try to make the sound last as long as possible and possibly be a little expressive as well. Um, yeah, so, but anyways, be that as it may, I don't feel that the pizzicato here underlines the bassoon enough to take away a sense of kind of, um, uh, of inertia that is developing from all these long notes in here. And especially when you get to here, right, and you add the horns, I feel the sense of inertia is actually very strong here, uh, compared to the sense of impulse by the uh, by the pizzicato neat that you're adding flute on top of the English horn um, and that should work pretty well um, it's a neat color okay now um, coming in here with your uh, with you know the answering <laughs> you know the answering uh, repetition of the theme, just played by the violins. Now look, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with adding more harmony and having uh, Divisi second violins 
or even just um, via second violins playing, you know, playing non divisi in thirds and fourths and sixths and so on. So just having like a single line accompanying the uh, accompanying the violin seems re- kind of thin after this harmonic, you know, like how how harmonically intense that things were right there. Right. Which essentially, I mean, let's face it, this is basically just doubling, you know, you're doubling the um, the bassoons with your horns, which is a really full sound, by the way, even marking this as pianissimo uh, for the horns, it's still going to be a fairly full sound. Okay, but still very nice, you know, very um, chamber like texture there. Okay, and this was simply charming, this, um, this little harp. Uh, this little harp arpeggio section, and it stands out very nicely. Now, see here, you did add some thirds and fourths and sixths and so on to your violins, but I think that you could have even started a bit earlier with that, just you know, just right after such a thick texture in the winds. Okay, now this was a really cool idea and great use of the celesta, you know, especially if you're keeping control over your textures so, um, you know, so careful so carefully, and coming out of the harp uh, part. Uh, keep in mind that this note is going to sound an octave below the harp, and then these two notes are going to be the same notes that the harp just played, right? So uh, this is a, you know, if you had ended this arpeggio somehow on this note, reading um, concert pitch in the middle of this staff, then that might have been a smoother transition so that it just doesn't sound like ding, ting, ting, like three B flats in a row at the same pitch, right? So think about that. Um, now this is, this is also a very cool little section. <clears throat> and um, yeah, keep in mind that this is going to be two octaves lower than this Celesta. Uh, you know, it's not going to be here. It's going to be like below the range, right? The range of the Celesta starts on C below middle C and is notated an octave higher. <clears throat> and, you know, I felt all of this was really fun. You're just really keeping, once again, keeping things very tightly controlled. And, um, and you know, within a very small range of sound. And, and that is a very, very cool, um, you know, chamber texture. This could have started pianissimo going to mezzo piano. All right, now we're starting to get a little bit more complex in here. Um, here I feel that the flute, the melody of the flute is not quite supported strongly enough, right? Because, you know, you're, you're basically, you're coming down here and then you're going up to this as before. Um, and, you know, you're not really using oboes and this would have been a perfect time to give the flute player a rest and come in with an oboe especially over this uh, English horn uh, accompaniment strategy here. Um, yeah, because I, I, I don't feel that this is going to be quite strong enough. You've marked it mezzo piano because it's just like an increase from the piano thing before, and you're, you're just carefully trying to, um, you know, to control the, the dynamics and have them go up by steps with each new, um, each new episode or sub-episode. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, and this is really cool. I really like the harp and the celesta working together here. I thought that that was really nice. And here we can hear the pizzicato much more clearly because there is not anything gluggy going on uh, in the uh, bassoons or horns below. Okay. And this was a really uh, Johann Strauss kind of touch. Boom. And then coming out of a da da dee 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 So, yeah, so I liked all of that. That was pretty nice. Um, and clarinets in octaves below the violins. So, I mean, this is once again like a chamber orchestration type uh, uh, type of sound rather than a full orchestra type of sound. And, you know, the full orchestra strategy would be to double at least one of these lines, like the usually probably the top line with second violins, and to have like maybe... The um, the violas just play both of these tremolos uh, divisi, you know, or or in you know just play them play them as intervals non divisi, if they could be played. So yeah, that's um, you know 
all through this, um, just mentioning that your sense of um, of slurring, of phrasing within the lines, um, is is very characteristic of of you know of of older waltzes, you know, rather than the sort of impressionistic waltz, and it works great. Um, some people might say, well, that's kind of taming it a bit, you know, it's kind of making it a little less dreamy and a little bit more practical, a little bit more danceable. But I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I I welcome all the different ideas that I've seen in these different scores. Um, this is nice. The flutes are going to be really dead weak down here. You know, that's like it's almost like not even worth bothering putting in the second flute until you get to this B flat here, right? Because the the um, this should be marked divisi, by the way. These octaves. Uh, this lower note is going to just be as as strong as it needs to be, and the flutes are not even going to add any color until it gets to be right about here, right? I'm seeing this a lot. Is there will be like a big sweeping phrase and. And it'll make perfect sense for the flutes to be playing at the end of it, but, you know, just like makes absolutely no sense to have the flutes playing at the beginning. So it's better just to have the flutes come in when they come in, uh, when they are, you know, if it's especially in a loud passage and in a big tutti kind of thing, just have them come in once they're audible is my suggestion here. Now, here is something where I feel you're going to get a slightly, um, a slightly penetrating sound if you've heard clarinets, exposed clarinets, ah, too, then you know what I'm talking about. It has a kind of a, almost a wind band sound. So you've got this kind of wind band root going on underneath the uh, the violin melody. Okay, and this is this is all the more reason why this should be doubled by the second violins because it re will really kind of it starts to get very coarse the louder and lower it gets. Uh, for reference, check out. Um, the opening of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. If you want to hear some really kind of raucous Atu playing, um, you know, just just how it uh, you start to hear phasing in between the notes. Okay, now we get to the Appassionata section, and uh, this is just very very cool. I I like the, you know, this was this was nicely scored. Okay, um, octaves in the first violins, matching octaves in the flutes. That's all well and good. Um, and uh, clarinet supporting the second flute, that's all fine. Um, there could have been more middle action. You know, you could have had um, the clarinets playing an octave lower than this um, just to spread out that octave better, right? Because it, it really does sound a little, um, a little high. Right, I mean, I mean, no, the the height is all fine, the the height of the pitch, but it isn't, the octave melody isn't integrated into the into the rest of the motion, right? So there is no kind of middle voice intersecting with some of the lower pitches in here, right? So that just really puts all of the weight of this melody on top rather than through, right? The um the counter melody was great. I'd like that scoring, second violins and violas in octaves, you know, English horn and clarinet are actually on the same pitch there. Um, those could have been spread out a little bit more. Uh, you know, you could you could have had the uh, English horn an octave lower than this and just the second clarinet there. Um, or you could have had the second, sorry, you could have had these guys switch roles. You could have had the um, second clarinet playing this melody an octave lower, and the first clarinet playing the counter melody an octave higher, and you would have spread the, you know, the support more across these octaves that are being played anyways. Um, the way that the that the bass line is scored is very heavy, um, but I like that this I like this, you know, I like these horns in the middle. Probably mark this forte rather than double F, right? Because it doesn't really warrant it with the lightness of the texture that you got there. Okay, and I'm glad that you left out the harp and the shalasta. Okay, and good cool down coming up here. Yeah, so here is where we got into, as I recall, here's where we got into some wrong notes. So you might want to just listen to the arrangement, look over the source score that you used, and check some of the harmony in here. Okay, because it's a, it's a, little, a little off. 
Um, unless, I mean, unless you intended some of that. Um, but yeah. Uh, and here, um, the melody just went back to the beginning rather than doing the, um, you know, da 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 It kind of went back to da 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 You know, and then here you went da 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 So, yeah. And Celesta is kind of nice. That's about as much as you want to do with Celesta in a place like this, rather than making it too complex or too pianistic. You know, it's funny, like, you could, using the word pianistic on the Celesta, but really, like, a, a, you know, a lot of dense harmony uh, does not actually work well on Celesta, because it just sort of gets too cloudy, too, um, you know, too intense, and you can't, you can't quite hear, you know, just sort of turns into this kind of clash. But here, this was nicely done. Um, yeah. And then, alternating... Uh, alternating views on the same little snippet of of score, um, and I I like this that you that you just put in a tiny little harp solo. I thought that was extremely effective. So you know, once again, chamber orchestra scoring. Now here, I don't think that this worked quite as well as you thought because you're extending. You know, these these dovetails are all seamless, and then you get to here and you hold this note as the pizzicato goes downward. So it. The only reason, I mean, this works fine as on its own, but I'm just, uh, you're sort of setting up an expectation with the listener that the dovetailing is just going to continue on down the winds, and then here when it stops and the pizzicato takes over, I mean, it's a nice surprise, but it still, um, yeah, it, it still kind of makes me wonder whether or not um, staccato bassoon taking over on this with a just a staccato uh, dovetailed note might have served you better there. And Celesta is charming, okay, and ending with the harp. So I like this. I like this ending quite a bit. I'm not so sure Colenio is going to work, though. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a neat idea, though. Uh, yeah, just, you know, keeping in mind that it is a very extremely dry sound, and it has almost no force or sustain. So basically, it's just sort of kind of putting a little punch behind these Celesta notes. Okay, and if that was your intent, great. Keeping in mind that the Celesta is actually sounds an octave higher, right? So, so these notes are going to sound an octave lower than your um, than these Celesta pitches. Okay, very cool score. Thanks so much, Travis. Uh, you know, pleasure to look at one of your scores. And um, now on to the next one. Our next score is from Usman, and, you know, this man is a really fine piano player and uh, just a great all-around musician, and it's interesting to hear his take on orchestration. I've seen some of his orchestrations before. They're excellent. Now, the thing that I would comment here is that I feel the tempo as, uh, you know, on your playback um, is quite slow. Um, you know, the tempo of this piece is da 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 right? Um, and right and in your playback it's kind of going da 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 Now, okay, it's fine for there to be different tempos on playbacks and so on and so forth. Um the problem is if you do some scoring for the harp. Um, at that tempo, and you are assuming, if you are assuming that tempo, then you can write things like this right here and get away with it. But as soon as you speed everything up to, you know, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, this is just, just becomes almost unplayable. It just really just becomes kind of a huge thing. Now, if there was, there was a way of um, tuning this into kind of um, enharmonically tuning a lot of these notes so that they, this would be possible as a glissando, then I would say go for it. But otherwise, you may be, um, you know, you may be scoring that a little too fast uh, because of the slower tempo um, that that you've chosen for your playback. It might be giving you the idea that you can go, you know, you can score more notes per bar. All right, so now let's get to the nitty gritty here. Um, an interesting approach to the phrasing. Da, 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 
So it puts the it puts the uh, emphasis on the anticipation, which is kind of cool. Uh, I like the use of the bass clarinet. I felt that this was actually pretty successful because you've got the pizzicato outlining things, but you don't have the bottom note being held, right? So the, the feeling is boom, 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 right? That makes it kind of makes more sense in terms of having a lift at the beginning of each group of notes. Um, and then, you know, soft violas, that's all good. Okay, now here's the problem is that, you know, that this, that the horn solo is really going to stick out. Things do not need to be mezzo piano here, right? P dolce. P dolce is, is the key here. Maybe the harp could be mezzo piano because it needs a little bit more uh, uh, um, cushioning in this, um, you know, against the horn. But, you know, look, you don't, you don't need to be mezzo piano here. And then here, because it's just a blah place, you know, for the for the horn player to be doing their solo, you know, it'd be better to say P dolce and then have little hairpins in here that kind of show us where the phrasing, you know, how the dynamic phrasing is going, right? And then have a little diminuendo at the end, right? And then this harp part will stand it w out way better than if the horn player is just basically playing mezzo piano sempre to the end of this note, right? Okay. Um, this was just charming right in here. And, um, you know, the, the, the little harp part with the um, tremolo, divisi uh, middle strings, that was very cool. And I like the emerging pulse from the, uh, from, the, um, from the cellos. I mean, that's pretty much as scored in the piano part. But I'm, I, I like the fact that you start letting go of these long notes which, you know, you just, you know, kind of don't need uh, anything dragging down the momentum of what you're headed for. This is really cute, <laughs> you know, this little, you know, da da da, da. I like that. Um, yeah, so this is very nicely scored. Um, you know, very uh, broadly cinematic when you open up here, right? I would say, watch out because you've got flutes above, English horn below, and first violin in the middle. Okay, so, so long as this doesn't go on for too long, you, you know, I mean, it's hard to maintain, but it, as long as it doesn't go on for too long, and there's a lighter hand, then it should work fine. Now, you could have, if you were uncertain about this, you could have easily scored violins in octaves, and I would say, like, in uh, an octave, the octave that, sorry, the, the note that you've written and an octave below would be really effective here because that would double the English horn and it wouldn't take away this nice shiny, um, the, the shininess of this uh, flute doubling from above, which as I've noted in a previous evaluation in this uh, video is, you know, it just basically adds to the, um, you know, unless it's played very loud and piercingly, it will just add to the resonance uh, or the overtones of what's going on, okay? So that's nice. This is a little too strong, okay? Uh, forte at on that high A flat, uh, written A flat. That is the that is the sound that you'll get there on that high A flat. But it's really just going to stand out from the texture. Just going to go. It's just going to. It's going to blare. You know, everything else is beautifully. Um, you know, it's just very beautifully constructed here. This is a little too warm. This is fine. Okay. Now, here we get into some very cool stuff. I thought, okay, uh, this is stuff that is better off for bassoons to do. It really, you know, this, you, know, it, you could it even just tell from your, um, from your playback that this was just be, you know, this was just too, um, too draggy, too, um, too forward of a part. It didn't really die down. It just kind of like, it clouded things up. It, it, it cluttered things up. This is cool, though. And I, I like the, you know, just the, the solo piccolo. Now, your phrasing is really not, um, it's just it's just more phrasing. It's not really instructions on how to breathe or how to tongue, right? You're basically just saying, da, 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 da. You know, there's like, there's no, there's no, you know, there's there's no push to any of the melodic elements, you know. Like ta 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 ta, or 
ta 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 right you have to t- you have to sort of like uh, tongue these yourself and sing them and to sort of to feel what that that uh, phrase is going to sound like right because I just feel that there is you know you started off pretty in an interesting way with this sort of pick up into the line but I, I mean I just feel that from there there is like like here you put a lot of thought into the how the the violins are going to be bowing it why can't the winds match that you know just just sing through this on your own and uh, just you know, see if you can get things to, to, you know, to sound better there. Because I just feel it's just, you know, it, I think the things should, should have a similar gestural um, capacity, you know, phrasing. Just, yeah, I just feel that that's just so much stronger. And, you know, really nice little oboe coming in there. And this is very cool. Very Ravel-like. Uh, it's too bad that your playback has such a clashy sound. For you know, like a light tim- a light cymbal stroke, you know, it should be just a little tish rather than a, <laughs> you know, just really kind of over the top there, on your playback. Um, yeah, this is cool. I'm happy with all of that. Now, <clears throat> this doesn't tell the timpanist anything. Crescendo, crescendo from what? Right? What is this? I mean, they're not going to be relying on anything that they played before if they played anything before. Right, so you just have to say what this is, and I would say in a texture like this, piano, right? Piano crescendo. Um, yeah, hmm. And this should also be say so now you're going boop boop. This actually worked pretty good. This should be marked. Um, see, these could all be marked piano. Uh, piano. Everything could be marked piano, and then the uh, horns could be. Uh, pianissimo, right? That's a much better balance because mezzo piano is not a. See, I know you want to you want to increase into this and then slowly build from that, but it just feels, it just you know just doesn't feel like I still you still feel it still feels like you're still in piano here, you know, like the way that this texture reads to me. Um, you know, and this is all fine. It's very cool, pretty well done. Yeah, and and that way here, crescendo from pianissimo. This will work way better. These um, this brass stuff. Okay, um, and it's kind of strange. You've got crescendo brass here, and then nothing, right? They're not crescendoing. The brass is not finishing the phrase. It just crescendos, and then see, and that's all the more reason why you should really mark this like pianissimo, pianissimo, crescendo from pianissimo. Because otherwise the brass is just going to blare and then all of a sudden there's this loud sound here that is a different kind of sound, right? Because it's not because the brass isn't dovetailing into anything in the following um, in the following arrangement. Okay, just a, just a small point there, but really important. You know, the details are very important. Triple octave here. Um, and you're know, keeping up the... Um, Keeping up the pulse here with a boom, 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 boom. This should be staccato, right? Right. And keep in mind, there's really no downbeat here, right? Um, you could supply that by having like accent, like accented tremolo, like um, mm, 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 like maybe forte piano, like da 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 da. So you get da da boop boop da da boop boop. Because otherwise, it's just mm, and you're just going bing 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 bing. Bing bing, and they're just really, you know, the only, the only strong downbeat is supplied by the melody and by you know the harmony changing position, and that's just not really strong enough as, as you're building up your energy. Okay, otherwise good scoring. This is really neat. If this could work at the actual tempo of the piece, it would be very cool. Maybe you could rewrite that if you know, just speed things up and then see how fast that really sounds like. Um. Now, now this is all, this is great. Atu oboes, the trills above, and this is very Ravel-like, like, you know, from Daphnis and Chloe. This has kind of looks like a passage from Daphnis and Chloe. Um, and I see what you're doing here with, um, you know, trying to, trying to sort of make this, 
make the counter melody in the middle uh, be more of a um, you know more of a separated kind of a thing and that's a neat idea and also like you've got these triplets in the second violins kind of behaving like a um, like a uh, like a, a, a busted up version of the melody okay that's all fun and these harp these big gushing harp chords very very uh, apt for right there um, you know you sort of just pull out your heavy brass right here for four bars, and I just wonder if you just even need them, you know? Um, it could just very well be that playing uh, bassoons and octaves as much as you possibly can, you know, would be better than just asking these people just to play for four bars, right? I, I kind of want to shy away from just, you know, just pulling out uh, you know, a couple of instruments just for one, you know, just for one tiny little gesture. So I would say just try to avoid that because nobody is going to hire those. Like in a practical sense, this wouldn't fly. People would say, you know, can you score that differently? So, you know, so we don't have to pay these people um, for just playing for four bars. You know, that, that would be the sense that I would get right there or that people would not say that to you, right? They wouldn't say that to you and they would just say, no, we don't want to do this. They, would, they wouldn't want to explain why they had said no. Okay, and that would be one reason. Uh, you know, I mean, Dvorak has a couple of instances where, you know, the tuba plays six notes in the entire symphony, but he's Dvorak, okay? And you are you, so don't do things like this. Just, I would say, figure out a different way that you can do this, right? Um, and, you know, otherwise, this is really a fun approach on it. You know, it's just, it might be strong enough um, it might be strong enough the way that you've scored it without having to, to haul out the heavy brass here. Good balance, by the way, though. That's nice. Okay, uh, moving on. This is nice, but it 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 really sticks out from the um, from the texture quite a bit, right? So I would say like I would actually mark this like um, I would start the diminuendo here. So that by the time you got here, the orchestra was the whole orchestra was kind of like mezzo forte or mezzo piano or some some smaller dynamic a little earlier, and then have this come in at like P dolce, right, with some lovely little hairpins in there to give it some color and character, right? Because otherwise, this just really kind of sounds sort of blaring and it doesn't have the you know it doesn't quite have the same. I mean, it's I mean, look, other people did solos. Uh, um, trumpet solos towards the end, but I don't feel that it's quite balanced the way that it's scored. That's all. That's all my concern is. Um, and this is all fun, the this approach here, and you know the tracking, uh, tracking notes from above. And this was really uh, just a neat gesture here. Okay, and once again, P dolce, right with hairpins. Yeah, and good good blend with the with the cellos. You know, this could as easily have been a solo cello had you wanted it to be, if if it were marked up, okay? And this is all just really magical, the way it's scored toward the end. So, um, yeah, and, and this was especially strong. Um, I think I did something similar myself um, in my score. So, you know, I see echoes of my approach in different scores. Now, um... Yeah, this is good. Um, so I, I don't really have a problem with anything towards the end. Um, I I would actually say, though, it says Divisi A3, why not give this to some of the other members? Like, why not have this, you know, first violin on top, second violin in the middle, and violas on the bottom, right? And here you're getting into territory that is just really, really, really high to play. And it would be better to take this approach, right? Having... Um, uh, artificial harmonics, so they could really easily reach these high notes without too much fuss. Okay, um, that's my thoughts on it. Um, I thought it's a pretty strong score. It needs a lot of tweaking uh, if you really were going to have this performed with an orchestra, but it is one of those entries that could be, that I feel could be performed, in a, you know, that has, has a lot of potential, you know, to get onto music stand. So, so nice work. Thanks so much for sharing this with us. 
Our fourth score comes from Martin Bauer, and it's a very cool, very cool arrangement. Um, needs a little bit of tightening up and maybe just thinking over some bits to, you know, to just think about the real world consequences of certain things. But, you know, but I really like the use of the contrabassoon and there are some other really cool effects in here. So, so let's, um, just take it for what it is. I would say all of the, um, all of the entries to this challenge have been worth listening to, uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the mock-ups that people have posted. I think those are all, you know, because they're very revealing. Um, they might be helpful if you are a more of a beginning or a developing score reader. Uh, in my case, I listen to them just to sort of see what the arranger thinks their score might sound like or what, you know, what was guiding them, you know, um, just, to, just to be sure of certain things. Like in the case of Usman, we just heard his score that, um, that, you know, that, that maybe the tempo that he was considering that it was at might be a little slower than he expects, you know, stuff like that. So moving on to this score here, it starts off with a alto saxophone solo. <clears throat> and, you know, this could be really nice. I mean, I would actually mark P Dolce, right? And I'm not so sure why there is you know, just a teeny bit of a swell here, you know, da 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 Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes, that, yeah, that that makes sense, yeah. Uh, it seems to me that the swell could come in a little earlier here, um, you know. Uh, now, <clears throat> here you are going, you, you introduced this sol tosto uh, viola here. Um, I feel that this is really um, more strongly expressed as a, um, uh, you know, m maybe this would be stronger in terms of violin. See, with this, to really, f for this really to um, work, I think mo the most successfully would be you need a large string section. This is presuming a large string section with all of these divisi staves, right? Um, yeah, and and here you sort of compromise between long tones, arco, which have a tendency, as I've said many times in these entries so far. It has a tendency to um, to sort of check the momentum, sort of uh, interfere with the with the forward pacing. <clears throat> but if you have pizzicato backing it up, that does help move things along. And and having the um, the contrabassoon uh, add little touches here and there that helps a lot too. But you want you're taking a um, a strategy where violas and bassoons double. Okay, and so I just feel, you know, are are there enough strings to really pull this off? This is Divisi in three, right? You've got, um, or it's it's really Divisi in four. You've got um, one quarter uh, of the violas on each of these notes, and then you have the half, the other half will be playing this uh, little line here to double the alto saxophone. In case people are really wondering what's going on here, I remind people to. Uh, to transpose down a sixth. Anyhow, um, moving on, uh, you add clarinet to the uh, to the line, and then also that's when the violas come in. So, with this mixed sound, you really kind of do need the violas in order to serve as a blend between the two, because um, clarinet, like a single clarinet and an alto saxophone added together, has quite an unusual sound. It can be quite penetrating, actually. You know, even at a softer dynamic. So the violas help to blend that, help to spread that. Anyways, just you know, just going back to here, you've got all these violins you haven't used yet so so you can you could spread things around without doing so much divisi all right moving on uh this is a nice exposed oboe line it, it almost doesn't even need this um the support from the violins but but you know but it still sounds kind of cool all the same the strategy you're taking here is that you are you know, instead of the second violins just holding the the harmonic uh, support down here, they are alternating by hitting that high F. So the F is going to have 30 violins in total, if we're assuming starting from a section with 16 violins and 14, 16 first violins and 14 second violins, etc. down the down the um, the section. 
that means that 30 violins are going to be hitting this, even at pianissimo. So, you know, that, that F is going to really stand out. Um, this is a neat idea, but I almost wonder whether or not this shouldn't be staccato rather than tenuto. Because, like, it's just, there's going to be, these are going to be weighty, as opposed to the, the, the beautiful staccato you've got going on in your trumpets, right? Um, and here you add, you say, consord, you know, in other words, to just add the, um, the mutes to this. And I'm not sure that you need mutes here, right? And it's just such a brief time to put on the mutes. So they would, they're just going to need those, um, those little rubber mutes that sit on the bridge, uh, or sit behind the bridge that they can quickly put on there. So this is a pretty tight change, I would say. I mean, it's not, it's a pretty customary thing nowadays, but it's just really assuming that the, um, that the player has got that kind of mute and and that they can just do it in a trice, you know. And a lot of people feel that those mutes are just not very mutey, <laughs> you know. I think that they work great myself. Okay. <clears throat> so you're going along solo, and then suddenly you have, um, like, doubling with flute and with oboe, okay, and all together with this melody in the in the first violin, that's going to be a pretty a pretty potent sound. Um, just to add all those together, it'll be very creamy, you know, just like a very kind of rich sound. But um, you know, the that that is a lot of weight in the in the um, you know, it's a, it's an interesting color at, at so long as it balances with P. There might be a tendency for the the winds to speak out a little bit stronger than the strings right here than the first violins. Okay, this is a neat idea. A second horn and alto sax uh, playing uh, boop boops in octaves with the clarinet holding down the um, the downbeat. That's a very neat idea. And then piccolos, uh, piccolo and flute, uh, octave apart, answered by the solo violin. This is a rare instance of this, of this uh, section uh, of the piece being taken as, um, you know, just sort of giving different bits of the melody to different players. Um, and, yeah, I, I think it works pretty well. You know, oboe going to clarinet, uh, you know, going back to oboe and violins, and then this little sweep up here. That's kind of nice. There's really a lot of, of fiddling around with mezzo piano. I mean, I just feel like... It just really is a lot of mezzo piano going on here. Just like, you know, just wondering how necessary it all is. Um, okay, oboe and trumpet being partners is great. But, you know, there are, there are very few overlapping tones. Like, see, here you do, you do your dovetailing really nicely. Okay, but here I feel that in order for this to feel like a unified line, there really kind of does need to be some kind of some kind of dovetailing here, okay? And usually when trumpets dovetail or trumpet dovetails with the oboe, it is muted to make the sound more similar, All right? Just a thought there, okay? This is going to stand out very strongly here. A2, you know, P crescendo getting to a an accent here. This is going to tend to dominate the entire texture, just this one little horn line here. So if that's... You know, if you don't want it to just sound, you know, have these notes just really stick out from the texture and, you know, probably overwhelm the violas quite easily. Uh, I would say put it in the background more, pianissimo. Um, yeah, and also it's going to interfere with this, uh, with the, with this cello line here. It'll be hard to hear. I would actually, I would actually probably prefer to double the cello rather than doubling these tremolo violas in all honesty. Okay, I just want to check something really quick. All right. All right, okay. Seems pretty good so far. Okay, very dark sounds going into this next little part. Okay, and you know, flute doubling for a while, but like then where does the support go? Right, you end here, and could oboe have taken this over, or the first flute continued? Maybe, you know, it just seems like 
like this is going to have a nice color to it and this is not right just you know, you know some of these things kind of don't quite continue on right you wanted to give your piccolo player time to take over so you cut out the you, know, you had the first flute take over this part so I don't know maybe oboe then or I mean there it just feels a little feel feels a little left out there okay and this is going to stand out very much in contrast in fact it's going to be extremely bright mezzo forte above the staff you know once you get up to a flat then uh, you know, even for a B flat trumpet it really is starts to become a very piercing sound I say like anything above G a2 for the trumpets tends to you know you really hear you really hear that there are two trumpets and you really hear their line extremely clearly you know you know so even at mezzo forte and then mezzo forte crescendo you're assuming this is going to be pretty strong the projection is going to be pretty huge okay of course you're heading to the appassionato section so that's not so bad um but but yeah um You know, once again, similar to a couple previous scores, there's just a whole lot of weight on the top for the melody. And there's like almost nothing going on, like in terms of a, of a third octave below, to integrate the two ideas against each other, the melody and the counter melody. Right? And um, I mean, this is some interesting stuff that you've got going on here in the lower winds. So, um, I mean, this, of course, typical, uh, this is interesting, you've got this doubling, the, um, the contra bassoon and the second bassoon are basically doubling each other's parts. That's, that's, a, that's you know, that's, a, that's an interesting way of taking it, rather than having the contra bassoon play yet a th third octave below and doubling the uh, double basses, right, which they've got... And this is neat—a neat idea, this sort of sliding down kind of idea. Um, yeah, it's—it's it's going to feel droopy, right? Neat, uh, you know, nice emphases from the um, from the percussion. All you ever need for a double bass—sorry, for a um, for a bass drum stroke—is just a uh, a single quarter note because the hall does the rest, right? You hit it. And then the uh, the stroke that you hit goes and inhabits the entire concert hall. Um, you know, so so unless you, there's a specific effect that is actually fairly delicate in terms of like um, you know sustaining the tone, I would say just mark single um, quarter notes for your uh, for your uh, bass drum hits, and also for timpani, it's a general rule. Just you know, all it needs, just you know. You, you might be saying, telling the timpanist, okay, we'll just, you know, don't damp it. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, the, the thing is, is that, that whether they do or not, the same effect is going to be heard because it's, a, it's you're, you know, the timpani is using the concert hall as its resonating box. Okay. So, you are aiming for like a sudden, like, this stays strong all the way to D, and then you diminuendo for there, keeping in mind that these things are still going to be really strong. Fortissimo, diminuendo from there. I, I wonder whether or not a lot of arrangers couldn't have started the diminuendo a little earlier before getting to this moment, right? So that this could be more like forte diminuendo. So it just would be easier to hear these lines, these little solos, and the sense of of cooling down could be a lot better right so because like for instance, for instance right here there's really almost no guidance at all to where the where the bassoons and oboes are going you know get to mezzo forte by here i almost feel like there should have been a little bit more to tell us you know diminuendo readjust to this and then diminuendo further by the way um these dashed lines can be really easily confused uh in in uh, orchestra parts. It's better just to say poco a poco diminuendo, and then if you really want to remind the player, when they get towards the end of the passage that has the diminuendo, just put another, you know, put another backwards hairpin. Okay, this was, this was pretty nice. I actually like this a lot. This was very cool. Seems like a lot of weight from the contrabassoon part, though. 
yeah, just that just feels pretty weighty. Almost like you just could have cut that and then come back in here or just use the contrabassoon part to back up the uh, the pizzicato in the bases uh, with staccato because that just feels a little weak down here. Do you know? Now, whereas this is just going to be very full-throated. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Trumpet to horn. And I thought this was very successful. Bassoons answered by clarinets. Uh, and this could have been stronger, too. You know what I mean? Just a little bit. Okay. And, yeah, and this was good. Strings to... Uh, flutes and clarinets, beautiful tone right in there, the way that you've scored it. This is going to be a bit strong. But not too bad. Not too bad. I'd say if this is mezzo forte, mark the horn piano, and even with the accent, it will give the right support. And yeah, just... Now here, once again, if you really want these lines to just merge into each other, you need to... Uh, you need to dovetail by having the next note finish, right, in the in the previous part, right on the same note that it starts in the next part. Yeah. And then here, this is kind of unnecessary. As much as I love the fact that you use the contrabassoon here, um, this would really need a dovetailed note, but it doesn't really need it because uh, D-flat is perfectly within the reach. This D-flat, which is actually just written D-flat... Uh, Written D flat on the contrabassoon is concert D flat below the staff here in the bass staff, and it is perfectly playable by the bassoon, which will actually have more control down there than the contrabassoon. Okay, um, I mean, I, I think I I see what you're where you're headed with this. You know, the contrabassoon. You know, since this is you know approaching the middle register of the contrabassoon, you can kind of like assume that the contrabassoon would be able to control that down to a minuscule pianissimo, but really bassoons overall have better dynamic control, um, you know. So, I mean, if you had a really great contrabassoonist, it would, this would work fine, but I just think that this is more of a bassoon line, in with all respect. Okay, nice little, you know, reductions, um, you know. I, I think you could just say two desks and four desks, or three desks here. I think that, that that's a that might be a better way of scoring that. And this is just really nice. Very magical. Um, yeah, a nice a nice entry for the glockenspiel. And, you know, triple P for the uh for the timpani. At this at this low t uh, um this tiny tiny low volume. It's almost the same exact sound as double basses doing tremolo in all honesty. Um, yeah, this is going to work fine. So I like this a lot. Really, really cool score. Lots of great ideas, Martin. And I'm glad that I could give you some feedback on them. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, do one more little kind of bonus score now, and we'll wrap up this round of evaluations. Okay, so we've got one more score here. Uh, this is uh, a completely new arrangement by a... Uh, an entrant who already um, entered a, a more orchestral score, and uh, Jean Martin. Um, I think this um, is really kind of more of a crossover score. There's like a lot of, it's a very jazzy sound, and the the scoring of the, uh, what they would say, the horns, right? Not, so just, you know, all of the, um, all of the brass wind instruments are sort of done in a band style with the lead instrument on the top, you know, the soprano saxophone, the cornets below that, <clears throat> horns, uh, four horns below that, and then um, three trombones with bucket mutes. Okay, all fun. Uh, and then just a regular string section below that. So, you know, kind of almost more like Nelson Riddle type scoring than, say, Ravel. And it's and I thought it was done pretty well. I, I still want to say though that this cannot substitute. This approach cannot substitute for, for a an approach that really thinks about the the way that people are tonguing and connecting notes. <clears throat> I mean, here you're having the uh, soprano sax player basically just go da da. 
And, and I mean, I think that just that's just really a long note or a long slur to connect. Um, <clears throat> it would have been nice to see a lot of this stuff with just really sensible, worked out uh, um, phrasing, you know, slurring connection of notes in the winds. <clears throat> now notice that the here the time signature has just been changed to 3-2 to really underline what happens at the beginning, right? And just to think of it as 3-2 uh, rather than as the um, the little beats of 3-4, the little bars of 3-4 that had the cross rhythm going through it, okay? And it's kind of neat that it sort of starts off almost like uh, like Bolero with just a little intro in pizzicato. Okay, so I don't really see any huge problems. I mean, there's going to be some overbalancing stuff going on, um, you know. And, I mean, this is really a score that's meant to be miked, you know, or or just, you know, it's really more of a bandstand type thing where you're going to be, you're going to be doing a somewhat electroacoustic kind of approach to begin with. So I can't really comment too harshly on the balance. Um, some things are going to stick out, you know, very strongly, from the texture from time to time. And there's also the sense that <clears throat> it takes a really, you know, it takes a really fine soprano sax player to be able to play under, you know, to get, to really get a true piano on a higher note. Uh, it's just, you know, I mean, I've, I've worked with some really good saxophone players, some really good soprano sax players. And, you know, the soprano sax just has a really bright, very, you know, very powerful tone. Um, does it need to be doubled by the second cornet here? It's going to come through fine without any help from anybody. And, you know, how much of a piano will come out of this forte piano? You know, you can, you can really, you can finesse it, and you can get a nice, you know, soft tone, but there's still going to be that really strong sense of projection no matter what you do with um, soprano sax. And it is going to build the higher you climb and the more you connect phrases, right? It's really not a flute. It can't. It cannot sound as soft as a flute or as soft as a clarinet. <clears throat> so, despite all that, kind of nice. Really, sort of using the strings almost just really as uh, you know accompanists for most of this. Um, yeah, this is going to be pretty strong here, even at P. Now, here I felt this was kind of overkill. Um, the repeats were overkill a bit. The um, the it's it's nice to have just to solo out some uh, a couple bars of umpapa, but you know, but here I I thought just maybe the repeat is a little bit too much. Um, good for going to three four as we are now really entering that, and that you didn't keep going with the three two. That was that was great, and um, this may be a little less successful than you think. You know, it might just just you know. I mean, for a good trombone player, this is going to be a really great challenge and really fun to play. Okay, um, and for a not-so-good trombone player, it's not going to be that fun. I would say put a breath here for the um, for the second trombonist and then have them come in here. Sure, they can breathe that fine, but it's just nice for them to really be focused um, in playing a solo, especially if they're the second player and, you know, maybe not the best player of the group. Um, yeah, and then you have your um, you have your third trombonist come in and play this. And same thing, I would say, give them just a, just a teeny bit of a breath. They'll take one anyways. You know, you could just put in like a little comma there, in their part. But yeah, um, yeah, um, and uh, you know this this worked pretty well. Now now you start having the violins coming in as you know as part of the melody, and that works pretty well. Um, you know the the violas plus the cornets is is not the most blending of tones. I'd say violins will blend with the cornets better. This would be better off as a violin part, just to just if you really want nice textural blending. I think the violas go way better with horns, frankly. So yeah, kind of interesting, interesting scoring here for the horns. That's very fun. Um. I really think you're missing some slurs here. You know, you really want everybody to go ba 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 bum, not dumb. Right, especially the saxophones, right? 
Um, yeah, and you know, you're building towards, and there's just some standard doubling here. First violins with the soprano sax, that will go together pretty well. Uh, second violins with the cornets, that is actually going to be a good blend. This is going to stick way out, and you could hear in the, you could hear even in the, um, the playback, which we shouldn't trust, but still, you could just really hear the the huge presence of this. I mean, especially since that, you know, essentially this is doubled, right? You're doubling um, the second and third horn and first and second trombone on the same uh, concert E, and then they're playing these thirds, and they are. This is going to be a big sound, right? With no kind of textural support from the strings, it's really going to stand out on its own and take attention away from your melody here. Um, and then, you know, just um, just wondering where the slurs went. Kind of, you know, dun da 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 da, or dun da da, right? Or a bum, uh, dun da 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 da. There's a bunch of different ways of doing this, but I think just just no slurs whatsoever is not good. Same thing here. Okay, all right. So, and this is all very integrated. I thought this was pretty nicely done. Triple octave for the main melody and then integrated uh, counter melody throughout the parts. Uh, you know, it just actually just really scores itself. You don't have to add any extra harmony or anything here. It's all just built right into the parts. Um, yeah, and a bit of a diminuendo here. Um yeah, just wondering whether or not, once again, that should come before you get to this point here. And does this really need accents on it, right? So, I mean, does it even need accents at all on that fourth bar? Maybe accents where you might put them at the, on the, you know, on these beginning notes. But, like, just really back off so by the time here you are really, you know, this is more like forte, and then you can diminuendo from there, right? Because here... Soloist, right? You want a solo violin here. As you're not going to hear it. You're not going to hear it if everybody's still playing fortissimo here, right? And and especially against the cornet, right? I don't think that that is going to come through as good as you think it is going to, right? So I would say really back off on your brass. This is really fun. These uh, this really Gershwin type ending. Um, I think Ravel would have totally approved. Okay. So yeah, this is, and then you just back off and it becomes more about the strings, and that's all kind of fun. Yeah, um, keeping in mind <clears throat> that, you know, nobody can really bow that, right? Think about bowings. Bow, 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 or bow, bow, right? Rather than da, da. I, I, I just feel that that's not a good strategy for bowing. Okay, and then things get slower and slower and, and the bows get longer and longer. You really need to do some editing on that. Okay. But yeah, I mean, just a just really fun, um, some fun ideas. There are some things here that I covered with you, some basic things about, you know, about bowing and phrasing and other kinds of things that I don't think, I don't think the lesson sunk in there from the first lesson that I gave. So please, everybody, really listen to these things, especially shaping the phrases of piano parts to fit the bowing of actual musicians, you know, sitting in their stands and trying to make them, you know, don't make the slurs so, so long at slow tempos. And, um, and, you know, just really think about what the enunciation of the phrase is going to be. It's all very charming, though, just needs a lot of tweaking. All right, but being your own orchestrator is really important, and also being an orchestrator for somebody else's project, really, really important. So if you can make these decisions and have them come out so that nobody has to raise their hand and say, I can't play this, uh, nobody in the string section is going to say, wow, you know, boy, it really took the concert master a lot of pencil work to scribble out some of those long phrases, some of those long slurs, and just really write in where they wanted you know where where it was pretty obvious that the bowing should be marked and the and the and the slurs should go. You know, you, you really want to take away from that because that that's like part of what I'm trying to build here is competence, right? The other thing that I'm trying to build here is a sense of cooperation and um, you know, in conspiracy, <laughs> right? We're all conspiring to make our playing better, our scoring better. 
So, um, so if people can really comment on each other's scores and help each other out, you know, good suggestions or even just encouragement, if you liked something that somebody did, please do mention it and please look at everybody's evaluations that you have time for, okay? And give them feedback of your own, what you thought was good, what you felt was better, some lessons that you are learning from these evaluations that you can help spread around in case there's something that I forgot to mention, okay? Or your interpretation of my advice. <laughs> Okay, so that was all really fun. A great batch of, uh, of arrangers there and arrangements, some great ideas, really individual scoring. I'm not really seeing a bunch of repeats of the same idea as um, there have been in the past with some of these evaluations where there were a lot of scores that were very, very similar. Most of these scores have been fairly different and, you know, just some fundamental level, there have been a lot of differences. So I really do appreciate that dedication. Uh, thank you so much. For your scores and I will see you for the next batch.